God's representation, which means speaking and acting on his behalf in this day of the Lord is his righteous servant of Isaiah 53. God's visible representation in the day of the Lord of Malachi 3 is God's righteous servant, who is the prophet like Moses, to deliver the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, which is basically how we know um, that the time to come of Jeremiah 31 is the day of the Lord, because the only other place you see a mention of the arrival of the new covenant is with the angel of the covenant that you desire. The only other covenant is that of friendship when Moshe comes. God grants the covenant of friendship. The prophet like Moses to deliver the new covenant to the Jewish people as Moses delivered the first. It's important to point out that uh, it's not new. He, God says, not like the covenant I made with the fathers out of Egypt. That's true. It's an amendment. It's a, uh, there's an addition to it and a confirmation of the first covenant. Yeah. Nothing ever happened to the first covenant. It's not terminated by the new covenant by any stretch. But there's an amendment and you find it in Malachi. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 22 be mindful of the laws I gave Moses at Oreb of my rules, commandments. <clears throat> um, it's being mindful because it was strict compliance at Oreb, Sinai, and it had to be 100% of the people. Well, God makes it clear. He realizes that's no longer the case. He understands that that's why there's a scroll of remembrance for those who revere and esteem his name and those who do not. He's recognizing that fact, even though when he um, speaks of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, he says, and all will heed me, and poor will be written on your heart. How's he going to do this? He tells you, because I'm going to... Forgive your sins and remember your iniquities no more. Okay, he's making a new covenant. He's delivering. He's saying this is what it's going to be. But he knows as well as we know. Just because you forgive somebody a sin isn't, gonna, isn't going to necessarily get them back to synagogue, spreading Torah day and night, and... Um, becoming one who doesn't have to other, ask other people's questions, but it will for a great majority of people. And he knew that. And he makes it clear Malachi 3, which is the last page of the last of the prophets. He stopped talking to his prophets. The Hebrew Bible uh, closes up. So, that, that's what that all means. As far as everybody has to, it becomes, be mindful. Now, each uh, uh, sect, I guess it is, of Judaism, ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, Conservative, uh, Reform or Reconstructionist, uh, they're all going to have to decide what that means for them. Every, as you can imagine, everybody's going to come up with something different. What being mindful is, but as Elijah, and I am the righteous servant. And I'll get to this, I actually handled the, the task of Elijah, David, and the prophet like Moses. Uh, I've already pretty much handled the prophet like Moses. I've, I've, I've written two books as Moses wrote the Torah. God told me what to write down, commanded and directed. So that's great dictation. I get real involved in it. He, he makes me feel like a writer. But, uh, but every word is it. It's, it's, uh, it's divinely received. So it's scripture, it's, it's not canonized, but it is new, and it straightens out a lot of things that Judaism has done wrong. They just like got it wrong, and, and he knew they would. There's a lot of cranky writing in there. 53 is a great example. The reason I'm cursed with disease, 
that I will offer myself for guilt and receive wrong life. Depression with disease has got one purpose. He knew the Gentiles were going to come up with an unblemished Lamb of God. And then they did it gets for sin forgiveness. It's a story, but he knew they'd come to it and they would ignore those words. They would ignore they they, they interpreted it to me he was he, he was brought to sickness, which brought him to grief. But the problem with that is in verse 12, he's exposed to death. So whatever this sickness is, whatever this sickness is, it exposes him to death and takes him to grief. In my case, that was cancer. So they can tiptoe around it all they want. But, uh, but I had to go through the cancer just because of that, because it, Ezekiel is your go-by for 53. The Spirit sees me. And I went in the bitterness and fury of my spirit, he says, in the hand of God. Now, I won't get to that. That's, uh, <laughs> that's not getting you, going to, that's going to God's boot camp. And uh, he doesn't have any, it doesn't bother him one back uh, to wound you, to hurt you mildly, to, to basically maltreat you. I, I call it torment. Sometimes it can be so bad, but it has changed me. Now, it took 13 years, but I'm not the same person he started with by any stretch of the imagination. It takes the fury from you. You know, Moses was like that. Uh, he got so uh, furious, he killed a man. Ezekiel was like that. I was like that. And that's, we call it his fire refinement. And, uh, I'll have a lot more on that as I go. Okay, the description of the righteous servant begins in three verses combined by quotes, which I don't see that anybody else has in the uh, renditions of their translation from Hebrew uh, to English. Uh, Shabbat, uh, Soviet singer, uh, Jews for Judaism, I, I just don't, I don't see it. And it makes a difference. Three verses combined by quotes at the end of chapter 52, which of course leads into 53, where God is the speaker. And then it becomes the witnesses in verse 1 of chapter 53, speaking in the first six verses, also combined in quotes. Okay, that's important because as we get through the story, the righteous servant is as lowly as these people are. For the most part, that's what that's what you gather. He was born from area of land, this and that, but rises to a great tree crown. Okay, he starts to lowly. Okay, then he goes back and helps them because they're in the same place. What is it? They're unrighteous. They're sick. They're not observant Jews. They feel badly before God. They, they don't live their lives correctly. They've got all kinds of problems in the family. They've got uh, problems at work. All kinds of things simply because they don't obey God's laws. And he says, you really need to get through this harsh world. You know, he says, it's nothing to me whether you, whether you abide by them or not. It's for you. You know, if you don't want to be a servant, I'm not going to pay any attention to you. That's just the way he is. Okay, here's the witnesses. This is the witness is, and they are the many made righteous. Remember, this man, he goes through all these things. He is, we're going to tell you, he, he was wounded. He, he was, uh, uh, he, uh, well, let me read it. Let me read what they have. But he ended up making the many righteous, and that would include all these people, all these people who are sick from unrighteousness. And uh, and then a multitude of people it starts out slow. The second attested. Okay, the witnesses who are Jews identify themselves as ones of the many made righteous by God's righteous servant, saying, "It was our sickness that He was bearing, our suffering He endured." That's verse four. 
He was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. Verse 5. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. Verse 5. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of us all. Verse 6. And see, offering for guilt. Verse 10. That's what the offering for guilt is all about. Basically, that's, that's, what, that's what you tell that I'll, I'll go remove their guilt by being the chief of righteous and make so many righteous. I'll make them righteous, their guilt is gone. And then what about all these words? Boom. Cast out. Sickness he took. This and that. That's God's boot camp. <laughs> That's where he, he uh, yeah, sleep deprivation, maltreatment. I mean, the, the stories are endless over 13 years because he's relentless. And he does not sleep, which means I don't sleep much. And, uh, you know, most of the time I can't understand why he's still doing it. I feel like I'm prepared and I'm ready. Uh, the last two years have been the most terrible, brutal uh, of the 13. Every year it just escalated more and more. And his response to that is, it takes more to get out of you what I want. These emotions, all these different emotions. He says, the more I draw them out, the more I maltreat you, the more I make you angry, the more you change, whether you can see it or not. In the short term, I couldn't. I couldn't see anything changing in the first three or four years. But it started to. And today, I can look back, and he can take me back. So uh, he can put pictures in my mind and, and, and make me feel as I, I felt in the beginning. And uh, I see a great difference. A great difference. Okay. Now, what I'm reading from here on my phone is from the books. So, you know, I'm kind of giving you uh, just a vernacular on it from my standpoint, and, but I make sure I read what he wrote because it's a, it's a lot clearer, uh, it makes more sense. But this is what I'm getting all this, is that God gave it to me. He, he taught me the Bible. He had me read it. We, we would go out on long walks. I had visions and um, and then we, we find after about five years got to writing a blog and uh, all the blogs became the chapters. The book of Ezekiel is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. In the book of Ezekiel, God sees him and made him suitable for the purpose of being a prophet to the Assyria, Babylon exiles in God's final assignment. This is from Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. But the house of Israel will refuse to listen to you, for they refuse to listen to me. For the whole house of Israel are brazen of forehead and stubborn of heart. Then I will make your face as hard as theirs, and your forehead as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, harder than flint. Do not fear them, and do not be dismayed by them, though they are a rebellious group. How's he going to do that? How's he going to make his forehead like an enemy? So he's got, he's got to calm his emotions, but they make him tough as a boot at the same time. Ezekiel says, The Spirit seized me and carried me away. I went in bitterness and the fury of my spirit while the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. That's the fire of a He's bitter and furious at God because he's hurt me. He's hurt me sitting, he's hurt me emotions, he's hurt me physically. He came into the ground with his, with his hands bound behind his back like he had handcuffs on. He has to lay on one side all day long and all night long for 390 days. You think it didn't happen? I think it didn't happen. I, I, I tell God, that's it. And he had 40 more days for the sins and the punishment of the house of Judah, he said. And that wasn't vicarious 
suffering either. It just corresponded to it. Basically, he was a, he was a crazy man. It would have infuriated him that he was taking the punishment for the house of Israel and Judah. He didn't know why. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've been trying to get them to stop sin my whole life. Just infuriate you. Okay? Little bitty things. Uh, chastisement. Give you a Jesus as Lord. I, he says, oh, Lord, I have not eaten the flesh of a dead animal um, since my youth. And God's response to him is, what? I give you cow dung instead of human excrement, my treatment and chastisement. That, you know, that, 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 that took like one minute of a day. I mean, he can keep it going for weeks, days, weeks, and months. But uh, that's, that's what that is with Ezekiel. It's 53. Ezekiel showed he'll bear the punishment for sin of the houses of Israel and Judah, and he is punished, chastised, maltreated, bruised, and crushed to make him suitable to be a prophet to the exiles and speak the words of God he is given during the ordeal and the anguish of it. Out of his anguish, that's part of Isaiah 53 too. You know, Jesus didn't come out of any anguish, he died. But that's in there. Uh, out of his anguish, uh, he will have devotion to, I can't remember exactly, but anyway, I think it's verse 11, out of his anguish. And that's what it's all about. And why did God write it like that? The same reason, the same reason Jesus and preachers the Messianic there. He just knew they would today in the day of the Lord. Because he knew the people of antiquity would. And that, which is understandable. They didn't, they didn't go to an age of science, an age of medicine, an age of reason. They didn't go to school. They couldn't read the masses, the great majority of all people. You know, they were like children who lived on emotion, who weren't very bright. They might have been brighter than the Arabs, but yeah. It was a tough time to live, so there's a lot of lot of story in God's book because that's all antiquity knew. That is so. Let me see, I can't read. Tell me a story. That's where all that stuff comes from. And, and, but you know, once, once you become enlightened and you have reason and you're an intelligent man, you're a school man, you got to start asking yourself, oh, wait a minute, how is nation going to love nation? How, how are you going to get this world to suddenly, out of nowhere, two billion Christians, two billion Muslims say to Jews and write about God all along, how sweet it will look. It can't happen. It's you can't have it. You can say that stuff in antiquity, and it's like that. Is great story. I hope that happens. It can't. It's not possible. You have two minutes history, Jerry. You just think it's gonna happen. And thinking that did what? It left out utter destruction to the land. And Judaism's teaching of the arrival of Moshe, which of course is when the day of the Lord is. Because the Lord appoints him to be the shepherd amongst the flock and dismisses the rest of the shepherds. That's all the rabbis of the world. They've all been dismissed because I am faithful. I have been appointed. But my appointment is not, this is the dynasty of kinship and kingdoms. No, no. I'm a shepherd. I'm a teacher. I'm not a rabbi. I'm not uh, ordained or anything like that. But I am a teacher. And I think that word means teacher. But, uh, no, it's this. It's what I'm doing. They're all this mixed. Of course, you'll still be going to synagogue and this and that. See, that phrase, they should no longer tend the flock after God has his reckoning and his message in from tending the flock. That works in antiquity. Again, you got to know how to read this thing. It, it, it's, it, it's a key part of it. There's antiquity in the Middle Ages, and there's the age of the, the common era, the age of enlightenment, science, medicine. Um, you know, we know you can't resurrect a body from the dust of bones. <laughs> yeah. These religious people in Judaism want, you know, I know what they do, they do what the Christians say. It's not faith, I believe. In other words, if you say different, 
You show them lack of faith. No, you're not. You show them intelligence. You say, you, you, say, you know, that shit's not going to happen because look what God does to do. You know, look at the covenant of friendship. And, 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 and human beings aren't created for utopia. We're not created to live like that. Rambam says the whole, all of the world will be for nothing but to know God. God wouldn't even like that. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't like it. Um, that's a whole other story, Ram. I got other videos of him. He made all this stuff that, that would be his perfect world. There's none of it's in the Bible. None of it's supported by God's covenant of friendship. He tells you, concrete, this is what's going to happen when I come. I'm going to grant this covenant of friendship and appoint David to ship. When David's there, so when Moshe had come, when Moshe had come, the covenant of friendship comes, and it's got all that you could possibly want, to do. Bottom line, they're never defeated as first again. And what he's saying is, if you don't listen to my father, if he doesn't clear the way for me to return to my temple, which means get it built. And of course, I can't do that on my own. I've got to have followers, which presumably is the one who made rights. People who believe me. I don't expect it to be a lot of people. I don't know what many in a multitude is. God won't tell them. We'll see. We'll see. But, uh, just having a man in divine being, see, like, the reason doesn't understand that because they don't understand the Holy Spirit's the person, which is absolutely absurd, too. Because he, just, he says he gets greed. Can't, you can't greed in an inanimate object or element. Uh, he goes to Ezekiel. He says, Ezekiel, speak. So he can talk. And then uh, to make a show of it, God, Ezekiel's in Jerusalem, God leaves ascends and then descends on a hill east of Jerusalem, which means the Holy Spirit, and then it says the Spirit of God, who would have been left there, took Ezekiel on a vision. You've got to be a person, and he is. Those are the divine beings. Those two are always together. The Holy Spirit is the angel of God's presence. And of course, what God's Spirit is, God is just like what I am, my Spirit is. You know, uh, he's an angel, and his body is not human form with wings. His body is the Spirit of God. So he's no Spirit and an angel. Um, but that's the man in the divine being. So when you read Isaiah 11, the Spirit of God lights upon him, you don't know that that includes God. Because he doesn't say it. But God is in his Spirit. Now this scripture on that, I'll leave that to some other videos. That make it clear God is in his Spirit. <clears throat> and he doesn't tell you why. This is my proof. This is how you say, you know, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe we had so many things wrong. But all of this makes perfect sense. And how does this man who was an atheist for 50 years, a Gentile, from Texas of all places, know all these things? and see all this that no Jew has ever seen before. Did I just suddenly become the greatest sage and rabbi in the history of Judaism? To the Jewish people? No people. I didn't. It's because God taught me. And now I wrote these books. And, you know, we're still fine telling them, you know, I have to have a human chance. You know, there's not a lot of perks in my job, believe it. <laughs> I, I had to, you know, they, I, I, I still forget things, they'll have me forget them. But they have total control of my mind. They know when I have forgotten something, they could tell me. Uh, you know, every so often I'll make some mistakes in my typing, and they'll leave it in there because it embarrasses me. Continuing to change me, draw some emotion from me. But it won't ever be anything that, 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 that hurts his cause, I can promise you that. Okay, so back to Ezekiel. Just like the righteous servant, except he's not crushed with disease and does not make himself an offering for guilt. And I told you what that was for. There was, that was kind of aimed at the Gentiles and uh, Christianity. 
The description of the righteous servant starts in 52. At the end of it, should be one, God passes his wrath from the Jewish people to those who told him to get down on the ground and walk all over there. There would be those, that group of Gentiles, specifically, that took your book and said, you don't know how to read it. It's prophetic of Jesus. But Gentiles in general, the, the, because the world has done that one way or another, but I think it's specific. So his wrath is on Christianity right now. And, and, I, I am the biggest arrow in the quiver. Because Isaiah 53 is a Gentile. God comes from Adam and other peoples, other Jews, none are with him. And Adam uh, is associated with Esau. Uh, and all his descendants were Gentiles. He married nothing but Gentile women, the Edomites. Uh, and Adam was in Jordan, uh, and that's Gentile lands too. So basically, I'm coming from a Gentile country, a Christian country, and I'm coming with a Gentile. There's no Jews with me. And nobody's known that. And, you know, how could a man totally fit the description of the Lord's righteous servant in Isaiah 52, 14, 13, uh, I'm just looking to the descriptive parts. This is where it all starts with 53. With his appearance marred, unlike that of man, that would be normal man. And just so marred, he shall startle many nations. In verse 52 to 15, there is a word. First of all, marred means to deceive. Or disfigured. That's what Mark means. Unlike that of other man. God says, I touched you in the womb. And took my right breast from me and withered my right arm. And I had to have some surgery up here so I could move it correctly. But it works good. It works. It works just as good as the left. It just doesn't have any strength. But it's fast. Um, I mean, I throw a baseball with it. But he did. He disfigured me at birth. They, so it started, but he never spoke to me. They came to me just like Jeremiah. They came to me at birth. And uh, I think Jeremiah says in the womb. But, but anyway, uh, because they had my whole life. They showed it to me in vision. They don't have all of your life. They know who you are just by looking at you. And they have a knowledge, an absolute knowledge that's beyond anything we can comprehend. But, I mean, they literally can send back the ambience of any event in my life. My first kiss, driving my first car, uh, and, and just uh, the different places I've lived. You know, it always feels kind of different when you live in other places. It's, it's truly amazing, but they, they, they had to show me that we did these things. We orchestrated these things. And, um, but he didn't speak to me until I was 50 years old. But he just said to me in the room for that verse, right there, just for that. I've never let it bother me personally. Oh, he said one of the reasons was I wanted people to pick on you as they pick on young Jewish boys just for being Jewish. You get picked on just for being this way. Just because bullies think they can pull you because you got a bad arm. Well, I told him, I said, well, what he really did is he made me one hell of a fighter. <laughs> he said, he made me mad. <laughs> you know, yeah, like I said, it's fast. <laughs> I just still hit you with it. But, you know, I had been in the fight since I got out of high school. And never could now. Of course, he never would want to. I live with God. And he lives within me and without me. And I've gone through all that. They're like two clouds. They come together. That's how God is in His Spirit. Well, His Spirit is in God, too. The elements of God's mind, that's His presence. You know, my presence is where I'm at with my mind. And then the elements of Spirit. Okay? They, they're like, it's hard, they're still in any room I'm in. Uh, but they slow through me. That's the difference. I'm messed in there with Him. Whereas, if you're in the room with me, they would just surround you. They flow through me. And so there's his power. And there's a heaviness to him. I always see him. It's not just... I'm
Because we talked about that up and down. I'm going to try to stop talking so much. At living, I could just be reading this straight. Picking back up, if I were to be seen with all of my injuries from accidents and surgical operations at one time, before healing, together with my congenital disfigurement, my appearance and features would be marred from that of a man and people. There's a long history in the book on my life, um, beginning with my first surgery to impaling my right knee on a Coke bottle, almost losing my leg. Uh, there's a lot of story on that, to uh, being shot through the abdomen uh, when I was about 18, I think it was, um, and almost dying from that. Uh, so we got a lot of scars. In, in total, we, I've counted up about 15 surgical scars. And about five of those come from the gunshot wound. It's just accidents. It seemed like I was in a hospital for two years getting stitched up somewhere. But um, get my teeth knocked out by a telephone receiver. And so here's what's... Here's what's uh, so that is how, everything I just said, is how a man can, could fit the description of the Lord's righteous servant in Isaiah 22, 14, and just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him. Okay, I went through all that. I'm marked. I'm disfigured. Uh, but I'm still alive. Now, you, you take care of your sin, you're putting the people of Israel as the righteous servant of God in Isaiah 63, all he, everybody in his story dies. I don't know how they startle anybody. Much less make the many righteous and a multitude. I, I don't know. You know and, and I get on these two, and you should do it even worse. The whole thing is based on something that's never going to happen. Uh, the Messianic era. It's, 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 a, it's a farce. I, I really, really sometimes wonder. If they don't really know that, especially Toby is saying, he's very intelligent. He's got information from here to there. But his reasoning capabilities on Isaiah 53, 10, because that's all I really got, is, is, is scary that it's so bad. It's scary that he went to Leviticus like the Christians did with Jesus and started applying human beings to an animal Worship an atonement system that God did away with in the times of the Bible. Nobody gets along right. Nobody makes anybody righteous. To think he doesn't really know, but then that would say he's a liar. And I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's the worst case of reasoning capabilities I've ever seen by an intelligent, capable man. That's what I'm saying. But he needs. He, uh -huh. But this is the day of the Lord. There's a new teaching here. He wasn't supposed to know everything I know. He was intentionally hidden from him in many ways. For instance, the Holy Spirit and the angel of, it, of his presence appears one time. And it's in the book of Ezekiel. God couldn't put that in the Torah. He couldn't have made it clear. He was clearer. Now in the Torah, he says, I send my angel before you. Do not disobey him. He will not forgive you. For I, Hashem, and in Him, there it is right there in the Torah. My name is in Him. He didn't want you to pick it up. He didn't want you to understand who uh, the captain of the Lord's host is. He's a harbinger of me. Three verses, and we find out we find out God's with Him, which means the angel is the Holy Spirit. So He's a man of divine things. That He's a Gentile. And that Joshua could recognize it. Three verses. And he said Joshua is not in the Torah. Kings shall be silenced because of him. And that's funny. The big thing about Jews for Judaism is what all the kings are saying. Oh, the Jews been right all along. She ain't never going to say that. And they've been silenced. It's like God had that written <laughs> by Isaiah. Because he knew somebody to do that. He said, believe it or not, God knows all things. He amazes me. I mean, I know you said, well, it's not supposed to say. And I agree. But it still amazes you 
when you, when you think it through with them, because he, it, it is a thinking process. But, I mean, they, they, he and the Holy Spirit, they just say, we just know. I say, you can't just know, you got to find it. He said, no, we just know. Well, I finally whittled them down to, okay, we think so fast, it's just a no. How about that? And we know the right answers to every night, every time. I said, okay, now I don't kind of understand that. But you can't tell me, because you can kind of go, okay, here or here. And so, I mean, you know, he said, it's true, but we make the exact right choice every time, and we do it so fast. We just call it money. I said, okay. There are still three men to come of the Hebrew Bible who are Moshe, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. Each of these great men were righteous, and all three were servants of God. One more man to come is God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, to complete, to complete all the prophecies left and, and covenants to be delivered of the Hebrew Bible in the day of the Lord, which comes in the last page of the prophets, are taken care of. The only thing we don't have is these four men. Well, you have them now. These four men and the two governors. They're all here. Having trouble getting them delivered and the message delivered, but uh, time will take care of that. So we got four righteous servants to come and a description of just one. And that means he has to be all four. If you're going to give a description of one, why, why, don't, you, why don't you have a description of all four? Well, I mean, how are you going to make a description for Elijah? You can't. I mean, because we all know Elijah from the Bible. And there's not this description in the Bible. David's one of the few that just said, you know, he's a very handsome man. And uh, it's just not many descriptions. The sages knew. The sages knew. So be the singer and... and uh, Michael Scobaker, too, for the interviews, and I don't know how many times I've heard him say, Are the sages so? <laughs> well, this is one you shouldn't have stayed from. The sages knew you had to have a description of Moshiach, and it was Isaiah 53. They called Moshiach the leper scholar. Okay, I'm the leper scholar. Why I was a leper? Well, that's really all you knew back in antiquity leprosy. Now, I can't say. There's, there's the disease. Scholar. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I don't practice. God had me quit practicing 13 years ago. Literally made me terminate my law license in Hawaii and in Texas where I was a board certified specialist in oil, gas, and mineral oil. He said, no, no, no. You ain't going to practice law again. I said, well, what am I going to do for money? He said, you're not going to have any. He thought that was so funny. <laughs> my Holy Spirit is going to laugh. You know, I mean, shit, it didn't hurt my feelings or anything. I mean, God said it. It is kind of okay. Huh. This is going to be a different time. The righteous servants is the descendant of David from Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, who is also the prophet like Moses to deliver the new covenant, the day of the Lord. And uh, that's Jeremiah 31, time to come. God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is anointed, you know, the servant of God aligns upon how much he the anointed one, the anointed one. Well, what's the anointment for? I mean, everybody can start making stuff up, but what, 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 what is he anointed for? To make the many righteous? There's one. To help God with everything, all the promises in the covenant of friendship to be Elijah, to clear the way for the Lord, uh, so that he can return to his temple suddenly. Their task, the, I'm annoyed for this task to teach as a shepherd amongst the people those matters God wants taught to straighten Judaism out, make it a more realistic religion. All religions end like that. The truth is, you have the God of creation who's going to live amongst you. And this is really as you need to be, and he's telling you you're never going to be defeated and dispersed again. And I don't care what you do. There's one song that says, you can all turn your back on me, and still not leave. I'll never leave you. And you tell the Christians that. 
I mean, they ought to be in there. And, and heaven, heaven is only for the Jews. Period. No Gentile, especially a Christian, is ever going to see it. If they want to go to heaven, when they die, they're going to have to convert to Judaism to come Jesus. You tell them I said so. You see what you, how I can be used to, to take the wrath of Christianity? Okay? Jesus is a Jew. The man describes as a Gentile. He can't be from Isaiah 11. Not because the line of Jeconia, his line, the line of kings of Judah that we have in the in the Tanakh, was banished, but because I came from the felled tree, the stump, I am the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse. Why is it a stump? That's the banishment. It's a stump because the only ancestral tree we know is the king. And that's the line of Jesus. They can say, well, clearly God lifted the banishment of to Jesus and we were with sin. Okay, that's fine, but he's still not from the stomach. And don't tell me God could have lifted the banishment. Well, he could have also had him come from the stomach. And he did. Shit, shit, shit. I mean, y'all, you Jews, y'all are his servant. I'm teaching you what he wants done. And one of them, it all starts with, you just have to try as hard as you can to believe in me based on what I'm doing. It's that simple. How did I become the smartest religious leader of all time? Now, they're all probably sitting out there going, oh, he's crazy guy, this and that. Nah, we don't believe in that. Well, I give you the scripture every single time. God's righteous servant by Isaiah 53 is anointed to make the many righteous and clear the way for the Lord. That is God's purpose that might prosper in Isaiah 15, 3. And in Malachi 3, where God says his messenger Elijah is to clear the way for him to return. If he doesn't do it, when I come, I'm coming with utter destruction to the land. The 7 million Israeli Jews. That number ought to ring a bell. A bell that says, never forget. In the covenant of friendship, God grants... When Moses comes, he says he will place his sanctuary among the Jewish people. He knew then, when this was written, there would be no temple for him to return to in the day of the Lord. So I said, I'm going to place it there. I'm going to place it there. Uh, he's going, he, you know, he said he can take me and get all this done. And which his servants should believe. Clearing the way is having it built for him to return when the door is open. Again, Spirit alight upon me, and God is in the Spirit. If I walk through those doors, God is just in it. And I'm a visible representation. I am the only man to see the connection between Isaiah 53 and the books of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Malachi. And to understand that Isaiah 53 describes a man for the day of the Lord, God's visible representation, speaking and writing his words as Moses did. I'm the only man to understand what the words wounded, punished, chastised, maltreated, bruised, and crushed are about. It is God's power refinement in his power to prepare Moses to be God's righteous servant, and that Ezekiel went through the same process. I am the only man to understand that the witnesses, of the first six verses are sick with guilt for not following God's law and not being righteous. So the man goes through, so I went through this fire refinement for them. They keep saying he was wounded for us. For us. And show me your sins. Right. You're unrighteous. I'm going to come back and teach you about that. I'm going to show you God is you. He is you. Remember, I was an atheist. I, I was a complete denier. You know, I needed somebody to come to me and say, look, I can show you how this is happening. Uh, I still probably wouldn't have believed the Bible. <laughs> I, think it ends over, I, think I, I certainly would have never read the Bible. For them, I just think you mean bad things happen to me. I'm just one of those people who take that position. It's stupid, but, you know, don't, don't tell me there's somebody watching over me. Don't tell me there's somebody who cares about me that I can't see. And no, I don't know who created the world. <laughs> That's not my concern. I just don't think about these things. 
I also become the life of servant. Here's an example. He is. He was wounded for our sins. He is. But not in the sense Christians believe in some sort of human sacrifice. He is wounded by God to make him humble to God. Uh, he's really... <laughs> I had to get still stippled and it's put that way and get a bone slit because he has absolute power. He can lift my hand up and smack it down on a boulder if he wants to, and he has. And you just, you just stun this belief and anger, rage, and horror because there's nothing you can do about it. Get too mad and you might, you might find yourself in a corn patch underneath the dirt. He's, he can be shit, but fear God. But he's got a great humor. <laughs> we're, we're all three laughing right now. Generally, such as you see me look over here, the Holy Spirit, his presence appears to be up here and to my right. And that's where he was speaking me from. God, doing these videos right over here in this corner of the room. <laughs> you see me look up at him thing. He is wounded by God to make him humble to God and suitable for God's purpose as a prophet, to remove the fury of his spirit, to be presentable to go to those who are sinning and bring them to observe it, Judaism and remove their guilt. That's the story of Isaiah 53. That is why he offers his God, himself to God for guilt, emotional guilt. He will go to the fire of fire and then go help them as God's righteous servant and makes the many righteous by his knowledge with long life. The reason I am the only man to understand these things is that I am that man. You cannot put it together if you are not going through it. No one ever has. And God had it written that way. This is the greatest proof you've ever found that I know how. And what all these words are for, there's no vicarious suffering. We know God says no man suffers for the sins of others. And it's hard to understand what are these people saying. And it's driven Judaism to <laughs> crazy. Why they didn't just leave the liver scholar some guy to come and the future will figure it out then? I don't know. I don't know why Jesus of Judaism did it. I don't know why Rossi did it. He couldn't support it any more than they did. He doesn't even address a lot of it. Look, those guys are smarter than me. You know, they are great men, great, great religious men, great spirits, this and that, but, but I have God with it, man. God tells me what these things mean. You can't, you can't get a greater authority. He controls my words. He controls my thoughts. Now, he makes sure I still feel like I'm Keith. I still think somewhat like I used to. But it feels totally different. And there's a reason for that. In heaven, you don't have your brain. This is a whole heaven story. He's got to be the information of your mind in heaven. I mentioned he's been with me since birth. He's the information of my mind. He's doing it to me as though I'm in heaven and don't have my brain anymore. And it's a different, it's a different uh, thing. The difference with everybody else, all the other Jews who are going to be there, is that he's not going to have the encounter to your real life history. So remember this. The information in your mind is going to be centered on Judaism, all things Jewish, Jewish culture, Jewish food, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, Talmud, everything Jewish. He just wants the whole Jewish culture. And so the rest of the world disappeared. And but you're still yourself. And of course you don't have a body. But he tells me, you'll feel as though you do, but you won't be hungry. There's a lot of, there's a lot of vision in heaven. And believe me, though, when you're in vision, this is real as, you know, going out for a walk in the street. It's just that real. Now, when you come out of vision, you know the difference. And that's the secret behind why God likes to be down here. That difference, because he basically, he has no eyes. He lives in vision. I mean, everything he sees, he has absolute knowledge of everything, every molecule of my body, my insides. He can see it all, but he visualizes it as in a vision, and, and it's very real, but when he's down here, it becomes more real for him. 
you really like, he wants to be down here living with the Jewish people. That he's a celestial being. And um, I know everything you, you could ever want to know about heaven that, that, that humans can understand. Okay, I am that man. You can't put it together. God had it written that way. And I am the only man who has ever lived, including Jesus, that, because that's easy, that shakes every verse. God orchestrated my life to be sure of it, to be a man suffering for me with disease. Marred, disfigured, you know, all kinds of calamities coming across me during my life, coming from the dissection of Um Please share every video you watch with all the Jewish people you know, secular and German, and all Jewish groups where it's accessible to do so. The rabbis will not talk to me. They're, they're, I'm not getting any response from anybody. No comments, nothing. Silence. I can't imagine they haven't heard what I'm doing out here. They have been dismissed before God, and of course I teach the day of the Lord, and there will be no Messianic era. We can call this uh, the Third Temple era, or the times of Moshiach in the day of the Lord. Awesome, fearsome day of the Lord. I want to point this out. If I if my camera stops, I'm not going. I'm not going to continue it. How did you get selected, Mister Mister Keith? How did you get selected? I was born in 19. This is the best I can tell you. He want. He's kind of led me to these ideas. But I was born in 1957. That's the year Russia sent up Sputnik, the dawning of the age of the internet. Ascension for the day of the Lord and for teaching me to, to, to reach all the Jews of the world. Essential. So he starts in 1957 to look. Now he's got to have a baby in the womb who's marred, disfigured, right? Now, see, now that's the kind of conflict I get with him. On the one hand, he tells me, I touched you with the finger of God and I marred you. Then we're over here in another story. How did you select me, God? Because I'm trying to find that. I mean, I know I've got to be a descendant of David through Solomon. I know that. Somewhere I'm on a genealogical tree. You know, they call me, yeah, I'm a tree. It's not a branch. It's a tree. <laughs> you said, yeah. I'm so far removed from David and Solomon. I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm just on the tree. I, I'd be surprised if my DNA even had anything of them anymore. But, uh, but uh, he said he had to be marked. And from a distance, from a from a family of tragedy, well, they, they, my mother's uh, grandfather committed suicide. My mother committed suicide. Very brutal story, by the way. Her father committed suicide. Her uncle, who adopted them, committed suicide. Blew his head off with a shotgun in front of her. So she's never been right. I've never had the kind of stable home you would want. Uh, her issues and problems led to drinking and pills and everything else in the 60s and 70s and uh, severe psychiatric issues. And, uh, you know, that's what he was looking for. He said, because you're going to the people who have been through everything. There's nothing. I mean, you're just bigger people pick on you, but that's nothing. You can understand people who, who don't have family because they all were murdered in the Holocaust. And, you know, I, I've got an idea, <laughs> and I've been through much myself. I've been exposed to this, uh, not one time, four times, at birth, premature, uh, gunshot, colon cancer, and then lung cancer, when they said, that's it. You know, it's untreatable. It's untreatable. Crushed with disease. This is Isaiah 53, 10. Crushed with disease, which God takes full credit for, by the way. Crushed with disease. They're getting the wrong one. You know, when they told me I had about a month to live, and I never saw a doctor again since that day until a general checkup just recently. When the planes hit New York, that's my proof I offered myself to help remove the guilt of the Jewish people by making them righteous. Thank you for listening. I hope to, you know, I know how hard it is to believe these things. I told you, God, two years into the refinement, well, I, I was quite certain that it was. As a matter of fact, you know the minute he speaks to you. He, he, puts, he puts the knowledge into your mind without even speaking. Um, I said, you know, God, of course, I, I know you're God. 
That's the thing we do. Is just, I can't believe he did it. Just, but you know what? It never comes to me anymore. I believe he did it. But it's still, it's, it, it, it's an awesome thing. It's beyond, because the human mind can't comprehend what he can do and say and think. You just can't comprehend it. Thank you for listening. Hope everybody has a good day. Oh. Uh, be sure to, 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 did I say that? Get the word out. We, we need everybody to lift me up so we can take the wrath of God to the Christians.